end. Why don't we start with how are you thinking through how you construct your portfolio amidst these very volatile times? You each have a very specific focus. Hugh, let's uh, bring you in on life settlements and uh, how you're thinking through constructing those portfolios in this time. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, and I think uh, Alan did a fantastic job if you just insert life insurance as opposed to art. Um, it's another extremely uncorrelated asset class. I think um, there's two really good academic studies out there that I've seen. They're a little dated, but the correlation is somewhere between negative 0.12 and 0 0.06. Um, to capital markets, so about as uncorrelated as it comes. Um, our view of risk is, is very much different than I think most, uh, most other people's view of risk here. Uh, we think about risk in terms of impairment, that is, what kind of disease the underlying insured that we are purchasing the policy from has. Um, you know, we do kind of care about what the capital markets uh, are doing, only in that as interest rates have decreased over time, we have not seen in lockstep, but in tandem, we have seen the discount rate at which we can apply to purchasing valuations compress as well. So the expectation is, is that as you know, we get tighter fiscal and monetary policy, we will see the ability for investors to realize larger and larger returns uh, come to fruition. Um, additionally, in this market environment, you know, kind of more broadly thinking about your all's portfolio construction, um, you know, the uh, the imbalance that this market creates for us is, as in, whether it's inflationary pressures or recessionary press pressures, people will turn to alternative asset class, whether it's art, uh, private real estate, um, or life insurance policies, which will only increase supply, um, thus increasing the spread that we can, we can realize for our investors' returns. Um, but going back to kind of the risks that we care about, right? So our largest risks that we, you know, that we think about that keeps us up at night is really twofold. So in the insurance policy marketplace, uh, policies have, and this is a terrible pun, so please excuse me, but a drop dead date. Um, that is the date where if the insured lives past, the policy just lapses. That's in, in not just term contracts, that's in universal and whole as well. Um, so we, we very much care about that because we view that as a risk that we can absolutely control. Uh, another risk that we think about quite, about quite a lot is diversification across carrier, right? We don't want to be overexposed to any one carrier, although I, I don't think a insurance company in history has ever defaulted on a payment because of the nature of their general account and also the nature of the state insurance that backs them up. Unnecessary to, to play in that risk. And then the more important risk, and this is the underwriting risk that we care about, um, has to do with that impairment, that disease, right? So the risks that we don't like are risks that have binary events. Think liver transplant. For us, if we invest in somebody who has a liver transplant, when, th when we're looking at their medical records, they might look terminally ill, but a year later they get a liver transplant and their life goes from a life expectancy of two years to eight years. That is phenomenal for them. We're very happy for them, but as an investor, that is something that we don't want to get involved in. Um, and there's other kind of uh, things that work invest against investors in the asset class, but in uh, an attempt to be brief uh, and make sure that you all get to cocktails on time, I'll, I'll stop there and maybe answer those questions later. Thanks. Key issues that we, you know, we've, we've been reporting a lot about is uh, markdowns and the illiquidity factor and especially given public market comparables, what that means for more illiquid investments. So As it relates to our portfolio, you know, our valuation metrics are not based on capital markets, right? We're co our correlation is to mortality rates. So our valuation policy is based on the Society of Actuaries VBT tables, which gets updated on a three to five year schedule. So from a portfolio perspective, we don't, I mean, we do evaluation on a quarterly basis. Because of the actuarial math, it can get very complex, but Generally speaking, market, like, market events like these don't have a direct effect on you know, our, the, our valuation and how the valuation is calculated. So in our asset class, what's very important is to actually dig into that valuation metric and understand what, what discount they're applying to the VBT tables and the actuarial math that they're, that they're using to calculate um, life expectancy, because that's how our portfolios are valued. As it relates to the broader markets and what's going on, you know, I would agree that this is a, um, a buying opportunity for the asset class in general because of all the things that I you know, touched on in, in 
the first part of what I said. You know, as as we get inflationary or recessionary pressures, people are going to look to sell sell assets, um, which means the supply and demand imbalance will create great buying opportunities. Additionally, I mean, if you think for no, no other reason than we've seen, you know, what, what is it, a uh, 175 basis point raise, in, or what, maybe be at 350, somebody said, by the end of, the, end of this year. Um, you know, if you're buying a levered portfolio, which we don't do, and your target is 15, and your cost of capital just tripled, you're, you're going to be more discerning about how you're deploying that capital. So your, your, your purchasing rate's going to go up. So that's all to the benefit of investors in the space, I think, over the next three to five years.